The Cisco Firepower point-to-point -point VPN configuration is fairly similar to the ASA configuration. We need to do a lot of the same steps. We're just going to do them in an interface that looks slightly different. So a lot of the concepts that we've discussed so far, things like network address translation, Ike version 1 versus Ike version 2, uh, making sure that intermediate devices allow IPsec traffic to go through, all of these are still valid on the Firepower appliance. So to create a VPN topology, we'll basically start off by naming it. This is an extra step. This is a bit different than what we did on the ASA, but I think it's fairly intuitive. Very similar to the ASA, we can support Ike version 1, version 2, or both. Next, we'll specify the VPN tunnel endpoint, interface, as well as protected networks. We'll set up our Ike authentication policy. That is going to be pre-shared keys or digital certificates, as well as things like a Diffie-Hellman group. Finally, we'll build an IPsec proposal which is going to include a transform set, which talks about how to protect our traffic. Uh, if necessary, we'll configure NAT exemption. We can allow VPN traffic within the ACP. And then if necessary, we can tweak our static routes. So here we see our topology. Uh, to the left, we've got the Cisco Firepower Management Center. This is going to be our management platform, which will manage the device just next to it, the Firepower Next Generation Firewall. Here's the interface for next generation firewall. You see at the top, we're going to be creating a new VPN topology, and we start off by giving it a name. This is a requirement. Next, we select the type of network topology we want to build, point to point, hub and spoke, or full mesh. For our purposes today, we'll just select point to point. Uh, here we've got Ike version. Again, we can enable version one if we need legacy support for other types of devices. Uh, if it's everything firepower, great, we'll just go with Ike version two and continue. So here we see below in the Ike version 2 settings where we're setting our Ike policy. Now the policy is AES. The authentication type has been set to manual key, pre-shared key, and then you go ahead and you type it in twice, once to define it, a second time to confirm it. In the case of Ike version 2 on the Firepower platform, the asymmetric authentication option is not available, which means we want to have both sides using the same type of authentication, that is either pre-shared key or digital certificates. At the end of the day, the hybrid authentication or asymmetric authentication, in, in my experience, has been a big loss. The only time I found it advantageous was when doing migrations. So if we've got everybody on pre-shared keys, a lot of times this is common. Uh, and then once their security posture improves, we're looking around for ways to make things a bit better. And we'll move off of pre-shared keys and move on to digital certificates. In the process of that migration, the asymmetric authentication is pretty handy. Um, otherwise, I don't really bother with it. Here we see uh, the configuration of your IPsec proposal. And under the IPsec tab, we've got a, a crypto map type. And it's asking here, is it a static crypto map? or a dynamic crypto map. Now, if you're not familiar with the differences there, a dynamic crypto map is typically what we'll use when we don't know the calling party. What do I mean there? Static is appropriate for site-to-site -site tunnels. Site A, site B, they both have static IP addresses. Easy. Either network A or network B can initiate the tunnel because both sides have static addresses and each of the router knows how to get to the other side, or firewalls, et cetera. What we have here, um, is gonna be just a touch different. Dynamic crypto map is where we've got the hub site, and then we've either got a remote user in the field, there's my laptop, uh, or maybe it's a branch office, and this branch office has got DHCP on the public interface. Why? Because it was maybe $100 a month less, and it went twice as fast, so why not? We go, well, can we still build VPNs if we're using DHCP? Yes, but we could use a dynamic crypto map. What that means is side A is willing to accept a connection from someone he doesn't know yet. Where previously, we had both sides statically defined. We have the peers set up by IP addresses. We couldn't do that here because of dynamic addressing or because users are out in the field connecting from all sorts of different places. So in those scenarios, on the hub site, you can use this concept called a dynamic crypto map. Talk about that more in the uh, remote access section. 
Additionally, working through uh, what is our mode. Remember that there's transport for host-to-host -host communication. Tunnel is what we use for carrying other people's data. Here, we see our Ike version 1 and Ike version 2 proposals. And below, we see our lifetimes. This is not going to tear down your tunnel. This is just going to renegotiate the key. It says after you know, X number of seconds, after X quantity of data, we're going to go ahead and generate new king material. OK, when you generate the king material, how do you pass it across? Do you just use the existing tunnel? Or, and here's that option, perfect forward secrecy, PFS. If we check this, our new keying material, this is basically going to be Diffie-Hellman, is going to be used inside of an IPsec tunnel. So we're going to use asymmetric encryption, just like we don't trust the network, inside of our VPN. Is that a little bit overkill? We say no, because our first key negotiation was outside of a VPN. If somebody captured that, if they cracked it, and they decoded all of our messages, they would get the new key at the end of that hour. So by leveraging Diffie-Hellman inside of our VPN, it's going to keep us more secure. So that's all that PFS does. We talked about NAT exemption a couple times. Here you see that the configuration for it is a touch different from what you saw in the ASA. It looks different, but we're doing the same things. We're talking about what did the packet look like when it came in? What did the packet look like when it leaves? If we don't want to translate the source, we say when the packet came in, it looked like this. When it went out, it looked exactly the same way. How about other traffic? Well, if it's not headed to a branch office, if it's just headed anywhere, we want to take the inside network and translate it to the IP address it's being used, perhaps by our outside interface. Uh, here, we've got a, a firepowered appliance. And within the rules section, we've got some rules that are permitting or possibly denying certain traffic flows. So we just want to make sure that all the traffic that's required for VPN traffic to flow in or out is going to be permitted. Additionally, we've got to verify routing. If traffic that's trying to reach the remote office doesn't hit that outside interface, it's never going to be encrypted. It's never going to go to the other party. How can that become an issue? Well, I've seen scenarios where summarization inside of an office, maybe we've got some switches, which are crude looking switches, uh, but we've got a bunch of them here. Layer 3 switches, they're all exchanging routes. And one of them that the last guy that worked here configured happened to have summarization on and nobody caught it. So while we've got maybe a handful of slash 24s in the network, a slash 16 summary is making it to my router or firewall that connects us to the internet. In that situation, let's say that 1010016 has been summarized by an internal device. If we've got that on our routing table, and we think that 10.1.240.0, which is supposed to be our Philadelphia site, uh, is out here somewhere, we would never get there. right? You may have a policy on the outside interface that says, hey, when you see traffic coming from our network going to 10.1.240.0, encrypt it. But because of this summary, we wouldn't ever try to send it out of the outside interface. Seems simple in a classroom scenario. It can be a bit more complex to track down real world. So just put one foot before the other. Make sure that your routing is working before you try to do anything more complex. If your VPN tunnel is not coming up, it's a good place to start troubleshooting. And again, speaking of troubleshooting, this is a very similar uh, flowchart to what we saw in the last section. And this is just saying, you know, first off, is the VPN traffic even allowed to go through? All right. Is it exempt from NAT? Because if you're NATing the traffic, it may not match a crypto map. Additionally, do we have our routing set up appropriately? If not, configure your routing. Next, if your routing is working, we should have an IPsec uh, tunnel established. If we don't, check your management session. Remember, phase one has to come up before phase two. So a show crypto Ike v2 essay or show crypto ISACAMP essay to look at that v1, just want to make sure that it's up. If that's up, we move over to IPsec with the show crypto IPsec essay. 